Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I just opened up the webinar, so you all are coming in. It is nice to have you here this afternoon on this Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Great. Great to see so many people have registered, so many people are interested in this funding. So I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, soft opening as people are coming in. Uh, my name is Lindsay Morrison. I am the Grants Director here at Florida Humanities. I am joined today by our grants coordinator, Stephanie Chill. Stephanie will come in at the very end to help facilitate the Q&A that we'll have after I move through the presentation. So if you have any questions as we are going through, um, I ask that you put those questions into the Q&A feature. Uh, it's the feature at the bottom of your screen, I believe it is, with the two chat icons. Um, you can put your questions there. Stephanie will curate them and ask them at the end. So all questions will be gone through. And uh, just not to put those questions in chat because that appears for all to see and that may be distracting for some folks. So do put your questions in the Q&A. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, today, we are going to talk about the Broadcasting Hope Media Grant Funding Opportunity from Florida Humanities. This is the second year we've offered this. The first year was the pilot program. So it was available for a limited group of people, just Florida public media stations. It was a roaring success. So we're very happy to offer it again this year with it revamped and revived um, to accommodate the organizations that it's meant to support, which is still public media stations, but also nonprofit organization, cultural institutions, uh, city, local municipal municipalities, and other cultural organizations. So today, what are we going to go over? If you are not familiar with us, uh, we will go over who Florida Humanities is, as well as what the humanities are. Um, I know that that word can see a little bit nebulous, a little bit tough to grasp and understand. So we'll try to give you the best definition we can to make it uh, simple and easy and condensable to understand and grasp. Then we'll go right into the Broadcasting Hope Media Grant, talk about the deadlines, the award items that you have to keep track on, uh, limitations of what we do not fund, as well as examples of fundable programs we do support, and, um, and more items like that. And then at the second half of the webinar, I'm going to go into the online application here via screen grab so you can see what the online portal looks like, what is expected of you if you're interested in applying and if you receive the access code the narratives, some behind the scenes tips and tricks, as well as the budget and information about the cost share requirement. Um, so this webinar is meant to be a supplement to the guidelines and what's on the website. So I do encourage you, I'm very glad to have you here, but do read the full guidelines and make sure this grant opportunity is a good fit for the projects that you wanna do and the dreams that you want to fulfill. Uh, and then do reach out to me, happy to talk to you about your interested activities. So who is Florida Humanities? Well, we are a nonprofit organization located in sunny St. Petersburg, Florida, and we are the statewide affiliate for the National Endowment for the Humanities. A uh, fun fact, every state has a humanities council. We were all set up in the 1960s in order to uh, distribute and facilitate the funding and the work that the National Endowment for the Humanities, the NEH does at the federal level. Our job is to receive funding from that federal organization and then re-grant those dollars out into our state's communities to support the projects happening on the local level. So you can think of us like a community foundation or a go-between uh, with these public dollars that are meant to support vibrant, rich cultural humanities programming that benefits local individuals and individuals as part of a community. So as it says here, our mission is to preserve, promote, and share the history, literature, culture, and personal stories that offer Floridians a better understanding of themselves, their communities, and their state. Now, the humanities, right, Florida humanities, that's part of our name. So what do the humanities actually mean? Well, they cover a broad swath, or they cover a broad swath of disciplines ranging from history, literature, poetry, philosophy, art history, anthropology. I won't go through all of them, but you can see them here. Um, but what the humanities is basically overall, over all of these disciplines, what it does, it is that they help us understand the process of pursuing our shared human experience. And through the exploration of the humanities, by leaning on those humanities disciplines of history, literature, anthropology, we can learn how to think creatively and critically, to reason, and to ask questions. So 
Florida Humanities in particular, though, while we support humanities projects, what we're really truly here to do is support public humanities programming, how we're bringing those humanities, which are seen in those academic disciplines, into the community to better who we are as a people, help us better understand ourselves, help us better understand our neighbor, our place in the world, and help us to be more kinder, empathetic, um, understanding people of, of other people's lived experiences. So it's really through draw, drawing upon those disciplines, drawing upon history, looking at the contextual situation of how a group came to be, what their lived experience is, and how they came to meet that moment that they are at, um, helps us better understand who we are as a society. So with that, we have several funding opportunities at Florida Humanities. We have community project grants, which offers up to $10,000. We have English for Families, which is a literacy program for libraries. Throughout all of those funding opportunities, we're seeking to support the humanities in Florida. And we're excited to launch this brand new um, in its second year grant called Broadcasting Hope Media Grants. This was an intention to um, really support humanities at a larger, broader scale, understanding that the media, whether it's podcasts, film, documentaries, TV shorts, have an incredible opportunity and are an incredible vessel to reach a large amount of people that sometimes are more common types of programs we support, like lecture series, forums, um, just don't reach, right, because it's just a larger mass group of people. And we also know that we need to put more dollars into supporting larger projects. It's sometimes not feasible to offer a $10,000 grant and ask people to make a documentary with it and impact a large group of people. So here we are today with the Broadcasting Hope Media Grant offering up to $50,000 um, to support those larger media projects that are all rooted in the humanities. So as it says here, we have it one deadline per year since this is a larger funding opportunity and the deadline is on Wednesday, August 17th, 2022 at 12 p.m. noon. Um, do keep note of that noon deadline. You may work with other grants that are 5 p.m. or midnight. Ours is at 12 p.m. noon sharp. So I would encourage you to submit your application on the day before August 16th just to make sure you reach that. There is a required cost share, which is another word for match. Um, it's one for one. So if you apply for 50,000 from Florida Humanities, you have to show $50,000 in cost share, which can be in kind or cash. And I will go over that later in the webinar if you are unfamiliar with those terms. These are also one year grants. So if you apply by August 17th, you will find out if you are awarded these funds on October the 3rd of this year, 2022. And you have until October the 3rd, 2023, to expend those funds and complete your project and submit the final report. So who is eligible to apply? This funding opportunity, like our other larger funder opp funding opportunities, is open to Florida public media stations, which is TV and radio, as well as now nonprofit organizations, institutions of higher education, state and local government agencies, federally recognized Native American tribal governments. Uh, who is this grant not open to? We do not award funds to individuals or to for-profit organizations. So if you are an individual filmmaker, what you will need to do is to find a nonprofit organization that can be your champion, your fiscal sponsor, and that nonprofit organization will need to seek funding from us. They will apply for the grant directly. Um, their project director will be likely someone on their staff, but you can be as the individual filmmaker um, their, their subject area expert or their main partner in that project. So the funding focus, this grant is unique in that it is one of our few grants that focuses on a specific theme. That is all the proposals have to in some way weave around a topic. And ours is broadcasting hope. What we're really looking for is stories of hope that surprise us and inspire us, how communities are coming together to inspire hope, shift perspectives and foster unity. Um, bridging differences, building connections, those are all the things that we're looking for. And that's not to say that we want to discourage you from seeking funds to raise up important topics that are maybe traumatic or painful or hurtful in a community that need to be heard. Yes, we do support and love to see those projects because in itself, the humanities is a great vessel to inspire those constructive 
conversations that help us understand each other better. And without understanding the full story, you're not able to, to have that complete picture. So you are encouraged to um, tell stories that are less hopeful, but there needs to be at the end of the production, some sort of message of unity. How are we gonna come together and move forward in the future? How can the humanities inspire us um, to be better people and be a better community? So like all grants, um, we have a certain amount of requirements that all proposals must adhere to and fit to in order to be eligible. And they're listed here and I'll go through them. So first, like we just went over, all grant proposals must demonstrate a key message of unity and hope at some point in the project at the conclusion of the, uh, the media production. Second, all projects must deepen public understanding of significant humanities questions and inspire constructive dialogue. You are not required to bring people together in a Q&A because maybe perhaps you just want to have a film screen or a create a film, produce a film, but you have to plan in some way uh, to inspire that constructive dialogue. Maybe you want to bring this film around in film festivals in the future or host a panel discussion or an opening, a film screening at the end. Um, just be sure that you're planning for that so that there is some sort of constructive dialogue. Um, all projects must approach a subject analytically, presenting on a variety of perspectives. So that's unique about the humanities and humanities scholarship is we want to see if you're bringing in one humanities scholars, are there other humanities scholars that you could bring on that they could bounce perspectives off of each other, um, deepen the conversation, make it a little more robust to bring in all those different perspectives. Uh, fourth, all projects must involve humanities scholars and, of course, other subject area experts in all phases of development and production. We will go over who a humanities scholar is and some examples of where you might find one, but this is incredibly important because since we are the affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, all of our projects must be rooted in the humanities and involve humanities scholars. For example, if you're working on a production and um, you may wanna bring in a scholar to help craft the scripts, or they may be a talking head that you could interview that they can contextualize the situation, as well as you want to bring in other subject area experts, maybe collect those oral histories, those personal stories. You know, someone is a subject area expert in their field, but you're not a humanities scholar. We love having those people participate as well. We just also require that humanity scholars be involved in the project. And then lastly, all projects must actively engage the general public through accessible program formats and be free or not cost prohibitive. So the whole point of a lot of the projects that we support, like I'm sure many of you, is just to get that great content out there to help limit barriers based on you know, socioeconomic means or status. We really want to get great conversation, great programming in the hands of people who need to see that, need to hear it, need to have those inspiring conversations. So the grant differs a little bit from last year, if you're familiar with our previous iteration of Broadcasting Hope. Um, now we offer two funding levels. Previously, we only had one, which was up to 20,000. As you can see now, we have more than doubled that and we offer two different tiers. The first is development, which offers up to $25,000. The second is production, which offers up to $50,000. Now a note that um, development, which we're gonna go over and go through what, the, what that goes into, um, is kind of like the phase one seen as production. So development supports meetings with scholars, that preliminary research and those interviews that you're collecting, maybe collecting oral histories, or bringing the public together in a history harvest to help share those, you know, bring out the stories from the community. Perhaps you wanna do prep or program treatments, work on a, a trailer as a work in progress, um, and then bring the community together like in community conversations or the like or panel discussions to, to bring out some of those stories from the community. Um, you can think of this if you're familiar with our community project grants. This is kind of like a bigger community project grant that leads to a media project eventually. Um, you do not need to have a development award before you apply for a production award. We wanted to provide these two funding levels because we understand some people need to complete this background work. They're not quite ready to produce something big and something large and bold, but they need to do the groundwork. And so we support this groundwork as well, you can request up to $25,000 for it. But if you already have this groundwork done or you can accomplish the groundwork and the production within one year, you can apply for up to 50,000 through the production award. 
So through this award, you can seek funding for archival research and rights clearances, still foster those meetings with scholars, bring the community together with community conversations, but also fund those scripts, those direct production costs. If you're bringing in contractors to produce a TV segment or a film, your you know, photographers or filmographers, um, developing complementary resources, like if you wanted to create a website to host this, uh, this film or this podcast series, so that larger production effort. I suspect from what I have heard that many people will be applying for the production award, and if you are, you can request up to $50,000 for it. If you do want to do a production award and you want to produce something, but you only need, say, $30,000, that's completely all right apply for the funding that you need. Don't feel like you need to apply for the full 50,000 to be competitive um, because we only award the funding that you need for your project. So just keep that in mind. So the award distribution, how are funds awarded? So like we went over with the contract period, all projects must be completed within 12 months and the sponsoring organization will receive the funds in, oh, I'm sorry, that says two, but it's meant to be three in three installments. The first, you get 70% of the award dollars up front at the start of the project after you sign the contract agreement and submit that cash request and ensure that you have your proper numbers, what's called a unique entity ID or SAM number. If you're unsure what that is, feel free to send me an email and I'll explain that there. Um, then you will receive another 20% of your award at the submission of an interim report, which will be due at an agreed upon time. Whenever we look at your work plan, when that middle point is within your project, you can submit the interim report, receive 20%, and then the final 10% is held upon a reimbursement basis after you submit your final report at the very end of your project and submit all the necessary documents there. And so just a note too, um, that all public, public programs and events supported by this grant project must not begin until six weeks after the contract start date. So for example, if you wanna have a series of community conversations that's going to be open to the public, the first community conversation cannot begin until six weeks after that October 2nd date. The reason we have that buffer is because there has to be you know, certain administrative tasks like signing the contract agreement, submitting that first cash request form, and then submitting what's called an event listing form to put that public event on our calendar so we can notify our board to attend, Maybe we want to attend as well. So just be aware of that six week gap. So what are some examples of some fundable uh, production awards? First, of course, is the most common that we'll probably see is documentary films. You want to collect stories from people in your community about a very important topic, raise awareness of something that happened, portray a message of hope and unity. We do fund documentary films. We also fund podcasts um, as well as you know lecture series or town halls. If you're gonna produce it, live stream it, put it together in some sort of final media project. We also support TV and radio segments as well as interactive websites. You'll see throughout all of these projects, there's a heavy emphasis on media, television, getting the humanities out into that digital realm. Um, and that's also key because with all of these projects, just do keep in mind that you'll need to, in the narrative questions, answer how you're leaning upon the disciplines of the humanities, which humanities disciplines you're drawing on, history, literature, poetry. Um, so we do not support just general um, documentaries that relate to the human nature. It has to lean on scholarship. So what are some examples of not fundable program formats? Um, first, we do not fund promotional films about one organization. Your organization may be doing a tremendous job for the community and it's very important that you relay it, but the purpose of these media grants is to look at a broader context, a broader situation to get at what it means for that community or the multiple communities that you impact. What does it mean as a whole to the state of Florida? So if you're thinking about a production or a documentary on just one, one organization, I wanna encourage you to think about what are some other partners that you could work with to tell a broader message. Um, you know, what is there a larger theme that you could be reaching? We also do not fund projects that are solely focused on social service or humanitarian projects that do not connect with humanity scholarship. So while homelessness, mental health, food security are an incredible, you know, topic to, to hit on and to reach with communities and they do impact and relate to humanity, 
the humanities are those scholarship disciplines where you're looking more at the history of a topic um, to come at a broader truth and understanding about what it means to be human. And lastly, uh, we do not support projects that promote a particular political ideology or advocate for or against any state or federal legislation. We have a whole paragraph in that in our uh, guidelines, so I encourage you to look at that. The reason we have this in here is that um, these funds are from the federal government, so this is a requirement that is put upon us for us regranting these dollars out to the community. So just be aware that we cannot support any partisan uh, documentaries or media projects. So a frequently asked question is who qualifies as a humanities scholar? You say, Lindsay, you've mentioned this a few times, um, but what exactly do you mean? So a humanities scholar is someone who has an advanced degree in a discipline of the humanities. That is who we generally consider a humanities scholar. This definition is something that we have taken right from the NEH, the National Endowment for the Humanities. So it's something that they use as well. So if they have a master's or a PhD in history, literature, folklore, anthropology, um, art history, musicology, uh, that would be a humanities scholar. Or they can be someone who has a advanced degree, like a professor of history, but maybe they work as an executive director at a local historical society. They would also be a humanities scholar. Not all humanities scholars have to come from that academic um, college and university sector, but all of them have to have an advanced degree in a humanities discipline. So just because also that say someone has a higher level degree like a PhD in marine science, they may be a scholar, but they would not technically qualify as a humanities scholar. They would be what we consider a subject area expert or a community expert. And we love seeing those as well. We highly encourage it because that sometimes makes the content more relatable to the community. Um, but just do note that you do have to have humanities scholars um, involved in the phases of your project. So another frequently asked question is, what are my chances of funding? Since this is the only the second year that we've offered this, I can't give a precise you know, a percentage amount. What I can do is tell you what happened last year um, and then you know, we can go from there. So last year we uh, received, because it was for a limited group, it was just for Florida public media stations. We received eight applications from I believe 24 potential applicants in the state of Florida eight applications and funded four of them. So 50% funding ratio, which is pretty good. Um, the NEH sometimes has a funding ratio, if you're familiar with them, of about nine or 11% because they're very competitive. Um, the state of Florida, the DOS has a similar um, you know, acceptance rate just because they're so competitive. We're not sure what the chances of funding of this will be, but I will say the more you communicate um, with us, with myself or with Stephanie, um, the more you ask those questions, the more competitive your application will be. So what are some keys to successful applications? Now that we've gone through what Broadcasting Hope is, what it covers, if you are still here and still saying, okay, my project could be a fit, I'm definitely gonna reach out. Glad you're here, let's look at the application itself. So first off, let's just look here are actually the four grants that we funded. Last year, we awarded $75,000 to these four public media stations, WUFT, WUSF, WGCU, and South Florida PBS. You can go to our Broadcasting Hope webpage and hover over these icons to see exactly what we funded, to see four examples. Um, and we were all just super thrilled with these projects. Just a note too, if you are tuning in and you are one of these four organizations, you will need to close out your Broadcasting Hope grant before you can apply again. An organization can only hold one Broadcasting Hope grant at a time. So the application components, what is involved? So with Florida Humanities applications, they are all online. You will set up, if your organization does not have one already, you'll set up an organization account. Um, you can have multiple people within, listed as contacts within your organizational account. Um, you'll go ahead and set one up. And if you're unsure if your organization has an account, feel free to reach out to Stephanie or myself and we can let you know. Um, and if your organization does have an account, we can list you as a contact so you can apply right from it. So within the application itself, we're gonna ask you a little bit about your organization, general contact information, that unique entity ID SAM number, your federal ID number, all those you know 
starter application questions. Then we're going to go into the narratives where you're going to narratively describe your project fully and succinctly. I'll go over those narratives in just a moment. We do have a budget form that is required. You have to use that budget form where you're going to detail what you're requesting funding for, how you're coming up with your cost share or match, and then your budget detail, which we will also go over in a moment. And then lastly, supplemental documents. Uh, these are the places you'll attach your work plan, media samples, letters of support, CVs, or resumes. So four main components. Um, I, I don't have an estimate on the amount of time, but I would say it you know, could take a couple hours to pull together just because it takes a little bit to write, draft, pull these information, you know, get your organizational budget and everything together. So the application narratives, what goes into each of these? So these are the long answer questions um, that's just below the organizational standard information Well, you'll have an opportunity within the word count provided to describe your project. The word counts listed in the online application do include um, spaces. So just keep track of that if you are writing these in Word and then copying and pasting them over. So first we're going to ask for your organization mission and reach, where you're going to describe your geographic mission of your organization, any viewership, listenership, constituents, members, if you've received any nominations, awards, or accolades, um, or anything of that nature, or if you've had a previous work with Florida Humanities, or if your organization has. Next, and probably I would say the most important narrative question is the project summary and humanities content. This is where you're gonna describe the meat of your project. What are the humanities disciplines you're leaning on? What specific themes are you drawing on? Um, what are the formats of the project? What resources will be developed to extend the reach of your project? Really think of this as like the abstract, except larger. Um, it has one of the largest word counts, so you can fully describe what you're going to do. If you need more space, you could attach a supplemental document that goes into things a little bit more fully and then just reference that in your narrative. But we do ask that you just keep everything within that narrative. And then third, creative approach, rights and permissions. That's where you're gonna go through your program's audiovisual style and approach. If you'll use narration, a host, interviews, dramatic recreation, animation, or other techniques, how the project will make a new contribution to that humanities field if you're hitting on a topic that's been approached before, um, those sorts of items. Next is audience promotion and underserved communities. So here we wanna see who your target audience is, who would be most likely to, to listen or, or watch this film, but then who are you really trying to reach that may not already be you know, welcome at the table or have a seat at the table? Who are the underserved communities that you're really trying to make an inroads in to help, to benefit? Um, we wanna see not only what communities you're reaching out to, how you're gonna make a difference, but how you're gonna reach out to them. So maybe you're going to partner with local libraries or local cultural organizations or translate your promotional materials into different languages. Um, it's just as important for us to see what you're gonna do as how you're gonna do it. Next is fees. Um, if there's gonna be any fees to participants either to you know, buy the documentary, watch it, a podcast series, if there's a paywall. Um, like I said previously, we do prefer that programs be either free or not cost prohibitive. Um, cost prohibitive we would say is you know, if, if the, the media is you know, more than $20 for a family of four to, to view, we really want to make our programs accessible. And then project personnel. This is also very important because it's in this narrative where you're going to describe your project staff on hand. For example, if you're a media organization, who are the main uh, personnel within your staff that are going to be working on the project? What makes them qualified to do so? But then it's also in this narrative, you're going to describe the humanities scholars involved in your project, as well as the subject area experts and community experts. And so a tip I would say here, is try to organize it within those two different paragraphs that we kind of have described your project personnel and then your, your, um, your humanities advisors or scholars underneath. You could have the humanities advisor's name like uh, Dr. Sally Smith. She is a professor of history at this university. She will contribute to this project by doing this, X and X and X, participating in this lecture and be very descriptive there about that person's particular role in the project. Um, we do ask that you include every humanities scholar's CV or resume or a short bio if they do not have one um, as a supplemental document as well. 
And then lastly, impact and evaluation. If you've applied for a grant before, you know this is pretty much in every grant application. So you receive the funding, what impact is this going to make? Um, how will you make a difference both in the local community as well as maybe at the state or the national stage? So here are some examples of successful narratives. Um, as you can see here, this one was borrowed actually from a community project grant because this is a new grant program. We've had to pull them from other successful applications. But this narrative is well organized. It is clear and concise. Um, it spends maybe the first paragraph or two talking about the history of the topic, but it's using the humanities content narrative to more so describe what they're going to do with the project at hand. Um, sometimes I see applicants fall into the trap of a plot or of describing what they've done in the past. That's more where you want to put that information in that organizational background. What we want to see in the humanities content is what are you going to do in the future if funded? Um, and then make sure you describe fully here the humanities disciplines that you're leaning on, the themes that you'll describe. So you can see this person here um, specifically talked about three questions that they're going to raise within their conversation. So some examples of unsuccessful narratives, um, the content is, you know, maybe too short, does not provide a lot of information, there's not enough for evaluators to go on, or it's difficult to understand. A good rule of thumb, you all may be familiar with this, is just have somebody else read the narrative that's unfamiliar with your topic. If they can understand it and what you want to do, then you're on track. Um, I would say, you know, of course, all of our all of our scholars and you know experts, everyone who is on our evaluation panel is a humanities scholar or is a, a board member or an employee of Florida Humanities, but we all come from different backgrounds. Like for example, I have a master's in anthropology, but you know, reading a, um, a proposal on musicology, I may be less familiar with. So if there's more jargon on musicology, you know, it, it kind of uh, hinders the evaluation process just a little bit. So just a note on that. So now let's go into the budget. So there is a required budget form within the application. Um, here we have line items where you can put dollar amounts for specific requests for different items. And I've listed them here. So I'll also have a snapshot of the budget form in the next slide. But the line items we have within the budget are honoraria for humanities scholars. Um, so if you have someone has an honoraria of $4,000 or $5,000 to participate in the life cycle of the project, here's where you would request that. Fees to production staff or technical consultants. You can request stipends for contractors or consultants involved in the project. I want to pause and just say an important note is that these funds, and this is a stipulation from the federal government again, we cannot support general operating costs like salaries with these dollars. Our grant dollars are really meant to support humanities programming that's meant to supplement the projects already happening within an organization. So if you are a salaried employee and you are gonna seek funding from the Florida Humanities dollars to support those contractor works, um, you just have to make a case that this project, this program is above and beyond your salary duties. Our dollars cannot go to salary at your organization. Um, if you have an external consultant that's doing work, that is an appropriate use of our fund that would not be considered general operating support and we could support their time and their work. If you have any questions on that, I recommend we get on the phone and chat. Feel free to reach out to me via email. We can go through that more in depth based on your individual situation. Travel per diem and lodging, if you need to uh, pay for staff or consultants to travel to different sites to collect interviews or bring people from another state, perhaps another scholar from another state, another subject area expert, or from another country, you can request support for that. Uh, production and post-production costs, rights to archival materials, um, equipment, software, audiovisual, if you need to purchase um, podcast equipment or you know something of the like, that's where you would request funding. I would note on equipment, um, if you are going to request equipment cost, we do need to know the life cycle of what you're going to use that equipment for. Um, so for example, you need a tablet as part of an exhibition. First thing that's come to mind, we just need to know what's going to happen with that tablet after this one year grant. Is it going to stay with that exhibition as a resource, which is what we prefer, or is it going to go somewhere else? Are you going to donate it to a library to support their humanities programming? So just be sure that you describe that within the, um, within the budget detail. 
publicity and promotion, uh, radio ads, Facebook, social media ads, um, creating graphics, hiring a graphic designer to create promotional materials, printing banners, those sorts of items, you can seek funding from our dollars to support. Or other, um, if you have costs that don't fit into these line items, um, the best way is just to reach out to me and, and just ask where they would go. So what is cost share? Um, we're gonna take a moment and just chat about that here. So we do have, like I mentioned in the beginning, a one-to-one -one cost share requirement. If you're requesting $30,000 for a production grant, you have to show $30,000 as a match or cost share. So the total project budget would then be 60,000, 30 from us and 30 from outside. Um, since these are federal dollars, your cash, your cost share could not come from other federal funds. For example, you couldn't match our dollars with another NEH grant, um, but they can be in kind, which is donated cost share. Say for example, um, a scholar is donating their time. They typically have an honoraria of $5,000, but they believe in your project and they're waiving their entire honoraria. So you can record that $5,000 that they're not charging as in-kind cost share. Alternatively, if you have a scholar who is um, charging you for $5,000 for their participation, but all of our funding is going right to promotion and production costs, you would record that you are paying that $5,000 as cash cost share, because that's coming from your organization. The cost share does not have to match up line item per line item. For example, if you're requesting 5,000 from us from uh, honoraria, you do not have to show exactly 5,000 in cost share. It can be made up from in-kind, cash, a combination of both or one or the other. So here is a snapshot, like I said, of our budget form that's online. You'll download this. It's a Word document and you can easily fill it out fill out the budget detail, which is on the second page. This is the first page. So you can see here, um, there's honoraria, fees for motion, travel. That top section is where you're gonna put what you're requesting from Florida Humanities. The second bottom section is where you will record that cost share. So you can see here, this successful application asked for specific amounts, 11,500 for honoraria, they need 2,100 for promotion, their total project uh, budget is 49,740. And in their cost share, they recorded at least a one-to-one. -one. They recorded in fact over that 49,000 that they're requesting from Florida Communities. Um, and that is what we love to see as well. So do please encourage, or we do encourage you to record your entirety of your cost share because what we do is we record our cost share that we get from our grants back up to the federal government and showcase how big of an impact our grants are making in the community. Um, so the more cost share that you are able to record, the better we're able to tell the federal government all that's going on in Florida. So on the second page of the budget form, there is a budget detail, which is probably more important, if not as important, as the front page, because it's here that you're going to describe narratively, line item by line item, where those dollars are going. You do not have to color code it as this individual did, but what you do need to do is just break it down. Where are those funds going? So for example, if you're requesting that 2100 for publicity and promotion, where is it going? You can see here that this individual said he's going to flyers, rack cards, ads in local newspapers. Um, so that gives us a clarity about where those dollars are going, because what we want to do is um, make sure that you're not requesting funds for any activities that are ineligible for this federal dollar, these federal dollars. So do make sure you um, put your full details within this budget details section. So unsuccessful budgets, um, here's just a little snapshot here. You can see this applicant maybe was not quite sure what they were requesting funding for. Um, so they put just very round numbers and they didn't describe it. Unfortunately, we cannot award blanket uh, funds to projects that were not entirely sure what's gonna happen. So just be as detailed as you can. I am happy to pre-review your applications as well as your budget before you submit to let you know if I see any red flags or if I recommend that you describe something just a little bit fuller. So after you complete your narratives, you've completed your budget, your budget detail, now you're gonna get into supplemental documents. We do ask that you submit a work plan, um, which is just a month by month plan that clearly shows how you're gonna go from the contract start date to the contract end date and achieve grand success throughout the project. Um, we do not have a specific format that we request for the work plan. We've seen them come in all shapes and forms. 
you could, you know, use Excel to create a color coded, you know, tabbed document, you know, that you're able to print off in a PDF and a fix here. It could be a simple word document where you have months and then bullet points underneath. What we really just want to see is how are you going to achieve project success? What's going to happen each month so that we can help um, understand your, your workflow. And then next is media samples. Uh, here we want to see some examples of projects you've done in the past, or you know, that may be either similar to the works that you're requesting funding for, or just examples of what you've done so we can see your work. If you're an organization that wants to create a documentary and you have not created a documentary in the past, that is perfectly fine. You're not gonna be faulted for it. Um, we love people who are trying new things, who are experimenting a little bit and who are expanding their organization's purview and reach. Um, just do attach the media samples of some things that you have done in the past, maybe a different format, maybe YouTube video. If you're using a contractor to or an external you know, film organization to do this documentary, you'll probably want to um, share a link to what they've done in the past. Just something to give evaluators a sense of what your end project is going to look like. And then other supplemental documents. Like I mentioned before, if you have a, or when you have humanities scholars, their resumes and CVs, if you have treatment samples, um, other examples of past success, media success, if there's been any articles or nominations, if you received an Emmy um, for previous work, do put all that there for us to get a clear sense, the evaluation panel to get a clear sense of, um, of what you're gonna do with these dollars. And also I will say letters of support go a long way. I'll just pause here and note that. So if you're one organization and you are going to um, work with a local library and do film screenings, getting that library's letter of support saying that they support this or the mayor or another nonprofit organization, or perhaps it's another film group that's going to work with you on this project. All letters of support, the more the merrier. That shows it's actually a true community project and we love seeing them. So if you are ready to apply for funding, what are the next steps? So first, you're going to brainstorm your project, look back through the guidelines, feel free to watch this webinar again. Um, I tried to go slow, I know I can talk fast, so feel free to watch it again. I will send everybody the recorded link um, and determine if your project is a fit. Think about who your humanity scholars are that you're going to involve, what humanities disciplines you're gonna lean on. Then reach out to me, let's have a conversation. Um, you can send me either a one page or document that describes your project fully, or if you wanna have a Zoom or a phone call, we can do it that way. I do just need to have a very clear sense about the project you are, see you are seeking funding for so that I can give you an access code if it is eligible. Um, I'm also happy to do a pre-review of your application, as I mentioned. So if you could send me that within one PDF document, I do ask that within at least two weeks before the deadline. So August the 1st, if you're able to just send me one PDF or if you can you know, download what you are already building out within the online portal, happy to do a pre-review, flag anything that I think just needs to be expanded or questions that I have that I might think the evaluation panel will have as they go through. And then lastly, of course, apply for funding. Don't forget the deadline is on August 17th at noon. Um, and feel free to ask any questions you have along the way. So we're doing really good on time. We actually have a little over 15 minutes to dive into the Q&A. So thank you, Stephanie, for hopping back on. And yeah, so what kind of questions do we have from the We've audience? Got um, but of course, if you are thinking of a question, just drop it in the chat, because if you have the question, somebody else likely has it as well. Um, so we'll start. Uh, there was a question about um, the the grants that will be or the proposals that will be accepted. Um, this goes back to when you were talking about um, the percentage of awarded grants. Uh, is there a certain number of development versus production grants that will be accepted, or will it just be that if it's going to be mostly production that is submitted as um, proposals, that would be what the money goes toward, the funding? Good question. Um, so the answer is no, there's not a specific bucket that we have for either or both. What we're interested in funding is just great projects. If they're all production, that's wonderful. If they're all development, that's great. If they're 50-50 or any sort of combination of the two, that's fine as well. What we're just looking to support is um, bold, innovative humanities media projects. Okay, um, there's a couple questions about cost share. 
Uh, the first one is uh, our salary. So if you have staff working on this project, are their salaried, their salaried work to the project, is that eligible as cost share since it's not eligible to be paid for through grant funds? Another good question. So we do have in our budget form a note that there is a 15% cap on costs that are overhead that you're recording as cost share. So overhead, you know, is... Um, you know, salaries or, you know, other fiscal administrative costs. So there is a 15% cap. So you can request or record 15% of your requested funds as cost share overhead. However, if you have direct programmatic time of salary, perhaps someone is um, salaried staff and they are working directly on a project for 50 hours, you know, making X amount of dollars, you could calculate that and record that direct programmatic time, which we do not consider overhead as cost share. And that is eligible. So that is fine. So yes, you can record salaries as long as those hours are spent directly on the project um, for other fiscal and administrative costs that do not directly relate to the project that indirect overhead costs, we have a 15% cap for recording as cost share. Okay, another one related to cost share. Can, just to clarify, can the cost share be 100% in kind? Yes, it can. Mm -hmm. and, and conversely or opposite, it could be 100% cash as well or a mix of both of them. So as long as it's a one-to-one -one match, um, that is the basic requirement for cost share. Yes, as long as it's a one-to-one -one match. And within our guidelines, um, we do have some other notes on the cost share. So all cost share has to come, you know, be recorded within that contract period. So October 2nd, 2023, so 2022 through October 2nd, 2023, um, you know, cannot be matched with any federal dollars I know I mentioned um, and a few other things. So just uh, look within the cost share sec section within the guideline. Um, and do you anticipate that this funding op opportunity, the Broadcasting Hope grant, will be offered next year as well? We can never tell. Um, every year is different because, like many organizations, we have to advocate for, for federal and state dollars year after year. So we do hope to offer this grant again. Hope to offer Broadcasting Hope <laughs> every year going forward. Um, I do see with what we funded last year, it's made a big difference in communities. These larger dollars go a long way to supporting some really great projects and, um, and supporting some great dreams that you all have within your organization. So we do hope to be able to award these dollars again. And there was one question regarding where do you access the application? Um, in the, I think everyone can see the answered questions. You can see this um, on our website. So if you go to the Broadcasting Hope webpage under how to apply, that will lead you to the online portal, which is where you will find the application. But do you wanna speak more to that, Lindsay? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, Stephanie? Finding the application specifically for Broadcasting Hope. Yes. So the application is only uh, viewable once you have the access code. But once you do have that access code, you are going to go to our online portal, which is, I'll, it's right here actually on the screen, www.floridacommunities.org backslash apply. And at the very top, you're, it's going to say access code and you click on that apply button. So at the very top of the screen, um, that's where you'll put in that access code. If you have the access code and you have trouble finding it, just shoot me an email. I can send you a screenshot of where you can locate that. Okay, we have a couple questions um, about, well, they're kind of separate actually. So I'll just start with the first one. Can the production budget exceed the 50,000 in the application? So um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, so your production budget can be, you know, if, if it costs $150,000 to uh, produce your documentary, that is fine, but you can only request $50,000 from Florida Humanities. You cannot request more than that. You can request less, but not more. So if your total production costs are $150,000, but you are only requesting $50,000 from Florida Humanities, that's allowable. And if we did not answer your question there, feel free to follow up if, if I need to clarify that. Um, regarding the, the situation, if we do have this grant um, next year, so let's say somebody applies this year for development, they receive that, would they um, have any like step up or be favored for the next round if they wanted to do production the following year and they applied for that? So uh, with every single one of our competitive um, 
cycles? That is a good question. We do consider them new and fresh cycle after cycle. So we don't give any other organizations a, a leg up because they've received a grant in the past or if they're a repeat grantee. Um, we really love supporting new grants as well. But if you did receive a development grant for this round, you did a tremendous job. You come back in 2023 and are seeking funding for a production grant and you have another stellar application that has great humanity scholar. Um, I think your application would be competitive. Um, and I do encourage you to do that, but we cannot guarantee funding for a second round if you do receive funding only for development this round. Okay, and uh, another question about applying. Do you still need the access code? Is it still required if you're already set up in the online portal system? So you still need the access code. You can set up an organization account separate from receiving that access code. Um, but the access code allows you to open up the actual application itself. So you can get in there, set up an organization account, put your contacts in there, but you won't be able to see and click on apply for this particular funding opportunity until you have that code from me. Okay, those are all of the questions that were entered. I'm trying to go through the chat because I that see one to get pretty active. Do you see one? Yeah, I see one here. It's a good question from Barry. It says, how are in-kind costs calculated based on what? That's a good question, Barry. Um, so for example, um, so I guess the short answer is they are based on the determined value of that service. So for example, honoraria that somebody is donating, if they're donating their time, if they are just a volunteer donating their time, say for example, you have somebody that's um, personing a table. I think the current public um, volunteer rate is $28 and change. So if they work 10 hours, you could record that $28 and change times 10 and record that as in-kind donated um, cost share for their time. Similar to scholars, if uh, you know they could calculate their donated honoraria based on what they're not charging you that they charge for other types of speaking engagements that they have, whether it's $500 or $5,000, the scholars genuinely know, um, know how much they are, how they're waiving. If you're recording um, other things like facilities rental, if a space is donating their, their space for free, then you could calculate those dollars that way. I think there's a follow-up question from Barry, production costs based on usual fees. Um, Maybe Barry, let's have a conversation about your uh, specific production costs uh, to see what, what usual fees you have and we can have a conversation on that. I think that'd be good. Okay. There, was, there was a question a little bit further up um, regarding the unique entity ID. Um, and just so everyone is aware, uh, we know that there are some holdups in the system. Unfortunately, we have no control over that. Uh, my understanding is back in April, there were many, like in the millions, as far as issues they were dealing with. And they've, they've drastically brought that down to a couple hundred thousand. So if you are having issues getting a unique entity ID and you've already submitted some of that paperwork, um, do reach out to make sure that you are in the queue with your questions for them. Um, they are working through them uh, as quickly as they can, as, as far as we know. Um, and then... If you are, if you're looking at applying for this and um, you're still having issues, reach out to Lindsay or I, and we can have a conversation to see if there's any troubleshooting we can do, or if there's any documentation you might have identifying that number from an earlier communication with the um, the system, uh, the SAM system. Yeah. And I see, a, uh, so just a reminder too, we will be sending out this recorded webinar and the recorded Q&A to everyone who registered, whether they were able to attend or not. Um, so you can watch this again tomorrow. If it was thrilling and you wanna sit down with some popcorn and watch it again, we'll send it out to everybody. All right, I believe that's all of our questions, but if you have any in the meantime, reach out to Lindsay and she'll be happy to answer them or me if um, you're just sending out emails. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you all very much for attending. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs>